on with now is we're just going to get some more structural stuff out of the way of the digestive system. So I'm starting off with this picture here, figure 23.6. Um, and I suppose we should be able to tell what we're looking at there, right? We've got four layers. We just went over this in lab. The luminal surface of the digestive system, that's the uh, lining of the inner tube. Well, that's the lumen, the mm -hmm. opening. And so that's where the foodstuffs would be for absorption. So that's the absorptive surface, is the lumen, the luminal surface. So if we went over the three layers, just real quickly, we have the mucosa, which lines the lumen. <clears throat> and below that, we have the submucosa. And then below that, we have the muscularis, or muscularis externa. And then we have this mesentery-derived tissue out here called the serosa, or the adventitia. Those are your four layers. Okay. So we'll formally go over it now in a little bit more detail. Okay. The most physiologically important surface of the mucosa is the simple squamous epithelium. So that's what we're seeing right here. It says epithelium. That simple squamous epithelium. And that is, as I mentioned, that's the absorptive surface. Anything we're going to absorb from the lumen has to pass through those cells. It's columnar. It's, it's, it's columnar. That's the way it's sorry. It's, it's columnar. Simple columnar. My bad. Simple columnar. Um, and then in um, lab today, we had, a, we had a look at, there are protrusions or folds in the line of the intestine, which are called villi, those finger-like projections. We have a model in there that has three villi, villi sticking up. Generally speaking, the function of the villi is to increase surface area for the small intestine. And I've read various descriptions. About, <clears throat> you get about 40 times the amount of surface area you would if it were just flat having all those villi. So it really massively increases the surface area. What you can't see at this level, you can't really make out the villi in here. You also can't see the fact that the surface of the epithelial cells, so now we're, we're talking about these columnar cells, their apical surface is folded also. Okay? And we call those microvilli. So a villus is a protrusion of the, uh, of the mucosa. Okay? Whereas a microvillus is folds of the plasma membrane of the columnar cell. Well, it's sitting where it starts. Okay. So the microvilli, which again, we can't see in this picture. These columnar cells here, mm -hmm. their apical surface is highly folded. Mm -hmm. But that's actually the plasma membrane. And that gets called microvilli, it's much smaller than villi. They both serve the same purpose. They both increase surface area. And later on in the slide said I have a picture of, a, of an electron micrograph of a single cell. We'll look at that microvilli a little bit closer. But I know sometimes there are terms that sound similar and I get the question, is this the same thing a lot? Well, usually it is, but in this case, villus and microvillus are very different. Okay? Hmm. A villus is a projection of the mucosa, whereas a microvillus is a projection of the plasma membrane of a single cell. Not a whole lot else in the mucosa layer I want to draw your attention to. And I think I misspoke in lab, I'm sorry. I told you that the lamina propria was the first part of the submucosa. Mm -hmm. It's the first part of the connective tissue of the mucosa. So it is connective tissue, but it's the superficial part of the um, uh, submucosa. I did it again, of the mucosa. And it's what the epithelium sits on. So if you're in the mucosa, here's the epithelial cells. And then you get a little bit of connective tissue, and that connective tissue that the epithelium sits on is called So I had all the right concepts, I just pointed the wrong here. In that lamina propria, that's where you would have patches like this. Remember what that stuff's called? A macrophage? Well, they would be lymphocytes. Yeah, it's a pairs. Yeah, I hadn't given that term before. It's mall. It's mall. Okay. Mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. And within the small intestine, usually that's called a pairs patch. P E Y E R apostrophe S. So that's right. It's called a Peyer's patch. <clears throat> so that's mold, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. And last week, a couple of the slides that I worked with some students with, it looked just like this. It was in the mucosa layer. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, most of the slides I've looked at, it actually extends down here into the submucosa. And you'll read when people describe it in textbooks and histology books, they'll say, 
it'll either be in the mucosa, the submucosa, or in both. It's not that um, rigid. As far as whether or not it tends to be more in one area versus the other in different regions of the small intestine, I don't know, maybe, but I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, now here's something curious. We've got a duct extending down through the mucosal layer and down into the submucosa. So <clears throat> generically, these are just called intestinal glands. The ones that have this shape, like that where they have a lot of coiled structures, um, they get called Bruner's glands. Bruner's glands, B-R-U-N-N-E-R-S, Bruner's. Also called duodenal glands, because that's where you have the highest concentration of Bruner's gland or a duodenal gland is the same thing. <clears throat> and if you look at the diagram, you'll see that they diagrammatically show them both being in the submucosa and the mucosa. And that's true. If it has a longer duct, it'll just be down in the submucosa. This is really the hallmark of when you're looking at the duodenum. You see a lot of these. You look at the jejunum and the ileum, you don't see anywhere near as many. I think you've heard me say before, the duodenum is where all the action of the small intestine takes place. It's where the vast majority of the chemicals for digestion get dumped into the intestine. It's where we neutralize all the acid coming from the stomach. <clears throat> Although we don't do most of the absorption there. We, do, we start all the chemical digestion, but then the subsequent next 17 or so feet of the intestine um, does most of the absorption. But as far as all the Things that are secreted, the vast majority of them are secreted through the duodenum. All right. <clears throat> then you find something very conspicuous. You find that muscularis mucosa layer. And that's this reddish layer here. And that's always something I try to point out to students because if you're looking at a histology slide, this is what you look for to be sure that everything superficial to it is the mucosa and everything below it is submucosa. So it's called the muscularis mucosa. It, it is part of the mucosa. It's the deepest layer of the mucosa. And I'd say about 95% of the time you can find that in the slide pretty easily. As far as what it does, I've never read too many compelling descriptions of it. The best one I ever read said that it probably just provides stiffness and support to the overlying mucosa. It's not really thick enough to constrict anything. It's only one or two cell layers thick. So it's probably a way of just adjusting the rigidity of the, of the villi. Nobody really knows. I've never read, like I said, a particularly good description for any important physiological function of it. Let's go to Van Marsh. All right, you go deep to that. <coughs> and we're into the, what? Submucosa. Sub, sub, sub of the layers of the digestive tract, the submucosa is the one that's going to vary the most. Okay. It'll go from places to where you, you can't even see it, like it's absent, to places where it takes up most of your field of view. It, it, it'll vary in thickness a great deal. Okay. It's a mixture of um, loose connective tissue, so you'll have some adipose in there, and you'll have some reticular connective tissue, and some, yeah, some kind of dense irregular collagenous too. Right, and then within that framework, you'll have, you can have some of the glands in there, lots of blood vessels, connective tissue, one of the hallmarks of connective tissue is it's highly vascularized, right? So this is extremely vascularized. It has a nerve supply, yeah, the little yellow guys in here are nerves too. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. Um, and then other than that, it, it, it just, it would have glandular tissue. And it's a separator between the mucosa and the muscularis externa. Usually when you find villi, so the classic textbook definition of a villus is it's a protrusion of, of the mucosa. But usually you see the submucosa kind of form up like a, a finger or a projection that goes up and it makes a mound. And that's where you find a villus. That's how it looks in the histology slides anyway. It's usually not quite as smooth as they show it here, but you see a little mound coming up and protruding through that. 
But it doesn't, it doesn't go through the muscularis mucosa, it just makes the muscularis mucosa bend up and go around it like that. And you typically see that in areas of the villus. Okay. <clears throat> now why do you suppose the submucosa here has got to be so highly vascularized? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, anytime you have a capillary network coming to the tissue, it, it's going to be supplying nutrients. But in this case, it's probably not the major role. Yeah, for absorption, exactly, for absorption. That's the functional role of the intestine is to absorb nutrients. So this submucosa has got to be super highly vascularized for all that absorption. So most of the veins that you see in here, these would be the intestinal or mesenteric veins. And so they would lead out here and they'd eventually become the portal vein. The green, the green represent um, lymphatic capillaries. So those are going to give rise to the lacteals. And I think I mentioned in class a couple of times, the lacteals, the reason you have such an extensive lymphatic capillary supply to the intestines is that's where you absorb fat. You don't absorb fats directly into the bloodstream because they wouldn't be soluble. You take them into the lymphatic vessels and when they're brought in there, they're complexed in a lipoprotein complex to make them more soluble. And then eventually, once they travel through the lymphatic vessels, they'll go back into the veins in a more soluble form. All right, <clears throat> then we get to the muscularis, <coughs> pardon me, the sterma. If you're looking at a histology slide and you're trying to figure out if you're looking at the stomach versus the intestines, this is where you go, okay? Because if this muscularis layer is very, very thick and it has three layers, not two, you know you're in the stomach. Stomach, we've got three layers the muscularis externa, and the intestines, we only have two. The order of the layers is always the same. The outermost layer is always longitudinal, and, the inner, and then the next layer down is always circular. In the stomach, we put a third deep layer, the oblique layer. And what's the function of the muscularis externa? Yeah, right. In the intestines, it's to do peristalsis. In the intestines, peristalsis is called um, segmental contractions. In the esophagus, it would just be plain old peristalsis. In the large intestine, it's called mass movements, but it's basically the same concept. And that's it. That's what the muscularis externa is for. It's for moving the food along through the digestive tract. And then finally, it's all wrapped up in a little dense connective tissue wrapping, and that's your serosa. Right here. The serosa is alternatively called the serosa or the adventitia. It's called the adventitia if it comes off of um, comes off the wrapping of, a, of, a, of an organ. So if it's derived from the visceral peritoneum, it's called adventitia. If it's in a region between different organs, it's called serosa. But for all intents and purposes, it's the same. That's something only probably a surgeon would make a distinction out of. The reason it's called adventitia is the mesentery that wraps over the organs, if it goes off and goes to another organ, then or to a lymph bowel, then it's called adventitia. So for your purposes, just know adventitia and serosa are the same. Now here they show mesentery. We talked about mesentery, I think, last time. We showed some pictures of mesentery. So remember, mesentery is that double-layered uh, membrane that's made out of, in this case, this would be visceral peritoneum and parietal peritoneum. And they make that double membrane. And in there run the vessels. <clears throat> it holds all the vasculature and the nerves and everything in place so they don't get tangled. And it's full of reticular tissue inside there. And I mentioned that actually macrophages can use that as a highway to move around. Comfortable with what mesentery is? All right, so the function of the mucosa, like I mentioned, <clears throat> I'm just going to kind of reiterate the main points that I just went over. The mucosa's main job is to do absorption. Okay? We want to absorb the products of digestion. I think I mentioned the two essays in this chapter are going to be cataloged for me of the digestive secretions, okay, and tell me what they do. 
and the other one is how we regulate, I guess, there's a 